Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this month's non-farm payrolls webinar on Friday the 6th of March. Um, Colin, Szynski and myself, I look forward to hosting you for the next half an hour and uh, hopefully um, navigating um, the non-farm payrolls numbers which are due out in around about 15 minutes from now. First and foremost, we're going to have to do the obligatory risk warning um, with respect to the, the webinar for um, Canada, Canada jurisdiction and UK and, and Ireland. And um, once we've got that out of the way, we can pretty much, we can pretty much crack on. Uh, one thing that I would say, ladies and gentlemen, is that due to the bad weather in the US, don't laugh, but uh, the numbers may be slightly late. They may be slightly delayed. They may not come out at 1.30 on the dot. Welcome, Colin. I can hear you um, crushing around in the background there. Um, so um, Colin Szynski, my colleague in Toronto, has just joined us. Say hi, Colin. Hi, everybody. And um, as I say, Colin and I will be basically taking you through the numbers. Um, and let's first and foremost um, show you and talk a little bit about what we're expecting. So bringing up the Bloomberg first and foremost to give you an indication of um, the numbers that we're expecting. I'm just going to scroll down there. As you can see there, the top line there, U.S. payrolls data face delay as weather hinders the D.C. opening. So um, I think the general consensus is we'll get them, um, but we may get them um, in a sort of a three or four minute window after 1.30, which should make um, for a particularly interesting data release. The so, weather's been positively awful this week on the East Coast. They've been, uh, New York has been uh, shut down, and uh, yesterday one plane went off the runway at LaGuardia, and it's, uh, it's just been crazy. They've had really, really bad weather all over the East Coast. Again, it's been a rather, again. that's one thing about the whole month has been, uh, there's been a lot of storms on the East Coast this month. Which sort of brings me, brings us back to the payrolls numbers, because if we look at what the payrolls numbers were a year ago, um, and that's basically uh, down here, this column here, column C, in January and February um, and December, they were 84, 166 and 188. And we know from a year ago that the weather did have a significant um, downward effect on the payrolls numbers. I think more importantly than that, the, the revisions that we saw last month um, were very, very positive. And I think one part of why I think um, investors are so positive about the US economy, I think is largely because of how resilient I think the US labor market looks. If we look at the November number, that was 423,000 jobs and then we got 329 in December and 257 in January. Now, um, what we've got here is a slight difference of opinion between Colin and myself about what to expect with respect to today's numbers. Now, we got um, ADP yesterday and the ADP column is in column B here and we also saw a significant amount of revisions to those numbers um, after the data release um, earlier this week. And, um, you know, again, we've had a significant downward move from the 284 that we saw in November down towards 212 over the course of the last few months. So there, there does appear to be a little bit of a direction of travel here with respect to the payrolls numbers. Now, that's not to say that we're going to get a disappointing number today, but the expectation is we're going to get a number in and around 240. Now, you know, my, my hit record in terms of predicting non-farm payrolls numbers hasn't been particularly great of late, so I'll admit that. But um, when you actually look at the weather and you also look at the fact that um, we've had um, some concerns about the effects that the, the decline in the oil price has had on the on the oil sector, the oil and gas sector in the U.S., um, you've got to think that at some point along the lines that will start to trickle down into the payrolls numbers. So, Colin, why don't you go ahead and basically tell um, the clients what you think is going to happen, and then I'll follow it up with what I think, and I would, I would, I would suspect the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, yes, indeed, because uh, Michael 
was around is in and around 190, and I'm around 240. And uh, the reason I've gone a little more bullish this time, those of you that were with us last month will remember that I had gone quite bearish on concerns about layoffs in the oil patch, and I ended up being way off and uh, and, and quite wrong. So I decided, okay, well, I just said this time, I, this month, I'm going a little bit more bullish with a uh, 240,000 uh, increased gas, which is slightly above the street at uh, at 235. Uh, I'm also looking at a 20k upward revision to last month to around 275. So I'm thinking that we still might have some. Uh, some positivity in the uh, in the numbers. However, I've also been telling everyone that I do think the risk to this month is to the downside. The, the sweet spot remains 200 to 250k, and that's been the uh, the case for uh, for pretty much the last year now. And we've seen the numbers in there in there for uh, at least the headline numbers for most of that. The uh, the reasons I do think that uh, that you could see the uh, a miss on that where it comes in lower. Uh, certainly, number one would be the uh, the oil patch. And, uh, and number two, in addition, not just in the in terms of the drilling activity, but also there's been refinery strikes in the United States, which actually have pushed up the gasoline prices now that there's working its way through the system in the last week or so. And uh, Michael has another number of other reasons to suggest that the uh, the risks are to the downside this month. Yeah, I mean, obviously, weather effects aside, um, there's also the fact that um, there was a port strike as well on the west coast. And that could well have impacted um, the payrolls numbers in um, in February. And um, you know, notwithstanding the fact we've also seen weekly jobless claims start to edge higher again. Um, certainly, if you look back over the course of the last few months, I think it's been very rare that we've seen numbers above 300,000. Yet, yeah, over the last three of the last four weeks, we've seen numbers come in above 300,000. Now. Generally, you know, generally there is a little bit of a correlation uh, between the jobless claims as they go up, generally the payrolls go down. Uh, but I don't think it's any coincidence that while we've had sub-300 um, jobless claims that the U.S. payroll numbers have been so good. So the fact that we're back above 300,000 and, you know, and, and have been so on a fairly regular basis does really beg the question as to whether or not payrolls growth will be as robust as we think that it is. So, um, you know, from my point of view, I certainly think there's room for disappointment. And I, and, and I also think that um, there is potential for a little bit of a downside disappointment. We've seen a significant rebound in the dollar or a push higher in the dollar over the course of the last few trading sessions with the euro dollar at 11 and a half year lows, cable at its lowest levels um, for nearly two years. And I, you know, and I think as a result, and I think as a result of that, um, maybe a good number is already priced in. So, with that in mind, let's look at some of the key support levels on cable and um, euro dollar, and look at some of the key resistance levels on obviously dollar majors like dollar yen. Also, have a look at Aussie dollar, Canada, um, Aussie Aussie dollar, Canadian dollar. Uh, but start, start. Let's start off with the. S&P 500. Now, this is a four-hour chart that I'm looking at here, and um, you know, we are, the the U.S. market does appear to be looking a little top-heavy. Um, certainly, there's good support around about 2084, 2085. Certainly, on the basis of that chart there, which I think suggests that maybe um, there is potential for a little bit of lag, um, ebbing momentum. Now, that's the four-hour chart. If we go to the daily chart. That also gives us a little bit of a an idea as well. Have we got a, have we got a rounded top coming in here? I mean, there is. There, I think there is a little bit of concern. I think the long shadows here suggest that there's good demand because we're not closing anywhere near the lows. That being said, um, you know, will a will a very positive will, will a positive number actually? push the stock market lower? Will a negative number, and a negative number is below 200,000, actually perversely push the, push the market up? And I think this is really what we've got to get our heads around. What will a positive number do, i.e. 250, 260? Um, well, that could actually potentially push stock market lower, push the dollar higher. Negative number, that actually could push the stock market higher and actually push the dollar lower because it will keep the Fed on the back foot potentially or away from a rate hike. So I don't know whether there's anything you want to add, Colin, with respect to the narrative that I've just outlined there, but I certainly yeah, I think, think you 
Oh, sorry. So, I think you're. I think you've got definitely uh, on that uh, the 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 response from the market. I think you're you're absolutely right. The other thing I note with this, uh, a couple of things. In the uh, the Dow chart looks pretty much similar, and in the Nasdaq's leveling off. Two things. First of all, if you had looked at the Dow and the Dax yesterday, new all time high for the Dax. Did not see it in the Dow. Second thing was, if you look back, not only are you seeing a bit of a, a rounded top here, but you had breakouts to new highs by the Dow and the S&P, and they're not very enthusiastic. The S&P got through 2100, it only got to 2120, and then it started faltering. It's not, a, you, you're not seeing this huge push higher in the uh, in the markets. Even when you've, you've gotten new highs, people are still kind of cautious about it. So it wouldn't take much necessarily to uh, to have spark a bit of a correction here. Not a, not a massive one, but you could see a percent pullback. Yeah, I also think the stronger dollar could actually hurt U.S. stocks more um, than anything else. And I think that's why yesterday we saw the German DAX push higher so significantly. I think because the euro weakened, and obviously a weaker euro is good for European stocks because it makes exports cheaper. And at the end of the day, the German DAX is probably going to be the biggest beneficiary of that. It's already up yeah. today on the back of this. So I think really with respect to European markets, I think oh, the key driver... Anything, Michael? Sure. Uh, oh, the key you, driver is – go on. You go ahead. Finish that, and then I'll mention something. I was going to say the key driver is probably going to be what the euro does with respect to what the DAX does, um, and obviously keeping an eye on the average earnings numbers as well, because we did see a spike last month, and I don't know whether you want to go into that. Uh, yeah, what I did want to mention was uh, actually looking at earnings and um, – I was just saying the U.S. earnings season, one of the takeaways related to the dollar was companies were starting to complain about the higher U.S. dollar and trimming guidance based on foreign exchange. Now, if we're coming up to uh, – we're coming up on 8.30 here. Do we want to mention the uh, average hourly earnings? I'll just uh, speak to that for yeah. a second. Yeah, so sure. Go if on. we're looking at – if we go on the theme that, uh, that there's layoffs in the oil patch, Something we got to know is those are really high-paying jobs. Those aren't the uh, those are not part-time jobs. Those are jobs that are paying eighty thousand dollars a year. Like they're serious money that's being uh, that p jobs that people are losing. So if that's the case, that should drag on average earnings. So if you start to you would expect the average earnings to probably dip back to two or even under two based on that on the loss of high-paying jobs. So if you don't get that, it would suggest that you are still seeing some pretty strong wage inflation in the U.S. There's also the additional factor that I think the, the spike that we saw in January was as a large result of 23 U.S. states bumping up their minimum wage by in excess of 10 percent. It was a good number, and actually some U.S. states bumped their minimum wage up by around about 21, 22 percent. So that will be reflected in the average earnings numbers. And I said at the time, yeah, it was dollar bullish, but, you know, is it a one-off? Um, we have also heard Walmart um, talk about raising their average earnings and putting all their staff on the minimum wage as well. So certainly in, in, in the short term, that's going to be positive for wage growth. But these are all low-paid jobs. So, you know, we've seen a significant rebound in the labor market, but we haven't seen a significant rebound in U.S. retail sales. And, I, and this is something that I really, really want to sort of bring to your mind, if you look at the retail sales numbers that we've seen over the past two months in column D here, we've seen a, a contraction of 1.7%. So we've got U.S. retail sales numbers next week on Thursday. So again, you know, is, even though we're getting all these new jobs, U.S. consumers aren't going out to the shops. They're not spending money, and they're not spending money. Um, quite, what they're doing is they're building up their savings. Personal spending slipped back for the second month in a row. So we've got a low oil price, we've got lower gas prices, we've got more jobs, and yet retail sales are slipping back. So there's something not quite right in the U.S. economy, and I'm not sure what it is. And that makes me worry about the fact that people are talking about a Fed rate hike in June. There's another factor. If everyone else is cutting rates, why would the Fed raise rates make the dollar even less competitive than it already is? You know, it, it would strike me as a, a little bit strange, the fact that the Fed seems to think that the deflation forces that are affecting China, that are affecting Japan, that are affecting Europe, and, there, and, and also affecting, affecting the UK. Inflation expectations here in the UK have got, are at their lowest levels for quite some time. So, you know, when you, when you consider all of that, 
I just can't help worrying that the market is too one way on the dollar. That being said, you can't go against the herd. And I think that's really the, the, the big question going forward. You've really got to go with the trend until such time, but you've got to be nimble and you've got to be ready to get out as soon as possible. Now, the key levels on cable is 151.30. I quickly want to show you that because there's a good support level there, but it also targets our head and shoulders breakout target that we saw in my video earlier this week. So let's get ready to rumble here. The number should be coming out sometime in the next few minutes. So we've got, then they could be late. We just need to remember they could be late because of the delay to the data. So they're due. We're waiting. Is it going to be a negative dollar number or a positive dollar number? At the moment, my Bloomberg's not updating. Neither is our platform, and that's because, sorry, the BLS website is temporarily unavailable. That's useful because everyone's trying to hit it at the same time. Um, so we're still waiting. Still nothing on my Bloomberg and um, still nothing on my platform. So um, we're not getting the data because it actually hasn't been released to Bloomberg yet. And... Uh, I'll just keep I'll just keep talking about right, the trade balance is out the trade figures are out a deficit of 41.8 billion dollars that's pretty much in line with expectations we're expecting a deficit of 41.1 uh, so that's um, slightly worse than expected but that's not really the number that we want to hear is it it's um, it's the payrolls numbers and we are still waiting for them from Bloomberg they well, still haven't been released. Yeah. While we're waiting, the Canadian trade balance is also out this morning, negative to uh, 2.4 billion deficit uh, versus Street had been expecting 1 billion deficit. So it is a little bit worse than uh, than the Street expected. That could we're still be, waiting uh, for Bloomberg, as you can see here. Yeah. Right, February payrolls. I've just seen someone tweet it. It's 295. I don't know whether that's true or not. I'm hearing mm -hmm. 295. Yep, there it is. 295. Bloomberg. Yeah, it's just come out. So we've got 295, 239 revision lower. So I was way wrong um, by 100,000 on that. It doesn't look like the oil sector has um, affected it in any way, shape, or form. 5.5, um, the unemployment rate has come down slightly. Let's look at the participation rate to see if whether, whether or not that's reflected in the participation rate. Um, still waiting for the average earnings numbers because it's the average earnings numbers that we're particularly interested in at this point in time. And um, still waiting for them. 5.5 still. So Euro dollar is going to carry on towards 108 at this rate unless we get a disappointing average earnings number. So certainly the key support on the cable is, as I said earlier, it's 151.30, still waiting for the average earnings numbers. That's dropped to 2%. That's dropped back to 2%. So actually that is, that is worse than expected. So on a monthly basis we've seen, yeah, 0 0.1. So actually average hourly earnings have slipped back. Right, I'm going to pull a Bloomberg off. Let's look at uh, the key support levels and resistance levels on the various markets. So we've got the pound against the dollar around 151.30. The trend line from the lows that we saw earlier this month is going to act as a fairly key support level down here as well as our head and shoulders breakout target from here around about 151.30. So key support there on the cable. Looking at euro dollar, we've got just below 109 at the moment. Let's, let's blow that out slightly further and see whether or not we can find the next support level on that. And it's probably going to be around these twin lows that we saw in 2003. Let me see if I can attach that to that. 107.94, those twin lows there. So you've got to think that the market's going to want to have a crack at that over the course of the next few trading sessions. We're pretty much there at the moment, but we need to stay below 110, 111 to do that. And obviously, this is the monthly performance on euro dollar. And, you know, this is an absolutely historic move lower on euro dollar on this particular time frame. And we do appear to have broken out. And that looks like a little flag there. So certainly, there's potential for us to move an awful lot lower on euro dollar. Dolly yen is probably going to have a crack at that 120, 60 level that um, capped the rally that we saw a few weeks ago. 
So again, keep an eye on that. And then we've got 120.80, which was the December highs, um, as well as the 121.85 highs that we saw at the beginning of December as well. So, you know, we're, we're approaching some very key levels on dollar yen on the top side. You know, have we got the momentum to take that higher? Those average earnings numbers would suggest to me that the Fed's not going to be any hurry to drop that patience language at its March meeting, which I think is due in a couple of weeks' time. Is that yes, right, it Colin? is. It's, I think it's the um, 17th or 18th. Just uh, you know, and, check and on my calendar here. Yeah. Yeah, it's the 18th. It's the 18th. Yeah. So. You know, for me, given what Mr. Dudley, no, Mr. Evans, Charles Evans said earlier this week, he is one of the most dovish member, voting members of the FOMC. He's suggesting that rate rises won't ha He doesn't want rate rise to happen this year, the earliest 2016. Now, he is probably one of the more dovish members of the committee. But the fact is, unless we get some significant wage growth, then I would argue that irrespective of these numbers here, um, it's going to make it very difficult for the Fed to actually look to raise rates. And yes, the unemployment rate did drop to 5.5%, but the participation rate dropped to 62.8%. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about by the participation rate in that respect, because it's generally reflected um, in the drop in the unemployment numbers, because the unemployment numbers only look at um, people who've been actually looking for work less than a year. I think that's right, isn't it, Colin? I think so. Yeah. And it, actually, if you look at the, um, the U6 unemployment rate, that actually doesn't paint as pretty a, st uh, as, you know, as positive a story. I think someone's just tweeted something along the lines of the U6 underemployment rate rose to 13.1 from 12%. That's the underemployment rate. So again, you know, the, while the headline rate may look particularly good, um, the underemployment rate would seem to suggest that it's um, it's going to be very, very difficult for the Fed to even consider tightening policy if you've got a very, very low participation rate. So, right. Um, so let's look at um, some of the other key levels. You wanted to talk about dollar CAD, didn't you, Colin? Uh, yes, let's take a look at that. So we had uh, dollar CAD has been forming a, uh, a big descending triangle here. It is going back up a little bit, but it's still uh, been contained within the uh, resistance line of that triangle. And uh, so you've got two things weighing on uh, pushing that up to the office. One is the U.S. dollar rally. The other is the worse than expected uh, Canadian trade deficit I talked about a couple of minutes ago. But basically, the uh, the other piece this week, though, was that the Bank of Canada did not raise interest rates and people thought they were. So overall, the do the loonie here is still looking toppy. It still looks like this is a, a, a top forming here and a base forming in, uh, in CAD US dollar. Cool. Okay. So basically, we're looking at 123.50 on the downside. And yeah, we're looking at 120. We're looking at around 126. 126, give or take. Yeah, what about 126 on the top side? So certainly we're not too far away from the 126 level. You know, and given how positive those dollar numbers are, the move higher in dollar Canada is not what I would suggest particularly stellar. Obviously, that's very negative for gold, um, those, those numbers. And we've broken below that trend line that I drew in um, from the lows in October which is another negative in terms of the overall direction of travel with respect to gold. And the likelihood is that we could well retest the lows that we saw at the beginning of this year or the end of last year around yeah, about gold was, 11. Uh, gold was going, sorry, Michael. Go on. Gold was going back and forth in the earlier part of this week. It tried to break out, then it tried to break down, and, and it was a bit of indecision there. But now it looks like this has definitely been uh, been decided to the downside here with uh, with this breakdown. And you look at the stochastics, and the momentum's trending lower. So uh, it does look like your uh, gold has uh, has resolved this uh, this dispute here with the with the bears taking hold of it. That looks fairly conclusive. That break. So mm. I think there's certainly potential for us to move to that next support level. Um, that we drew in from the lows um, at the beginning of January, the end of December there, that spike low there. So certainly worth keeping an eye, keeping an eye on that over the course of the next few sessions. Crude oil, 
let's look at WTI. They're continuing to, to diverge. Brent crude. This is a range. This is a range play for me at the moment. Um, certainly, you can you can see it being played out on the four-hour chart here. Um, given how far we've declined, um, there's certainly significant resistance around about $62 a barrel on the Brent contract. Um, there's there's good support around about 56. You can certainly draw a trend line on this chart here around about uh, 59 $59.50. On that move there, a bit of a, a bit of a continuation pattern perhaps of this up move here. So maybe there's potential for Brent crude to break higher over the course of the next few trading sessions. Um, WTI is fairly similar, albeit at uh, lower levels again. It's a similar sort of box range um, that we've been in since the beginning of February, with once again. Um, $54 on the top side, $47 on the downside, but we are trading in a nice up channel there actually. Let's draw that in to give you an indication of where the boundaries are. I'll just draw that there. It's holding at the moment, but certainly if you look at that, that's quite steep. Um, if it does break, then I would imagine it will probably test these twin lows around about $49 a barrel. That is quite a steep uptrend. Key question is whether or not it's sustainable at the moment. But as I say, you know, we've had a very strong number, but I would caveat the strong number with um, those concerns that I have about the participation rate dropping, um, the underemployment rate going up, the U6 underemployment rate going up, and obviously the decline or the the slightly worse than expected average earnings numbers, given the fact that core inflation um, still remains well below 2%. You know, and I think that's really what you've got to look forward, look ahead to. So while we may get the dollar look to test higher today in the interim, um, I still think you know there, are, there still remain significant doubts about whether the Fed will be able to consider easing monetary policy in June. So, um, being asked about silver, more than happy to talk about silver. Um, I just reiterate what I was saying earlier about asking questions. Uh, David, uh, you need to use the chat chat facility. Um, so, I would just say ask questions here, so that you know where to ask questions. Yeah, dollar yen, dollar yen will rally on a strong dollar number. I've just been asked about that, but we need to break out through 120.80 to target 120.85, 121.85. So if we get a break through 120.85, then certainly I think we can retest the highs. Um, certainly that's the direction of travel. The dollar will remain strong and we'll certainly want to test higher um, today because that's where the momentum trade is. But next week we may find that some of those gains get given up. As regards to silver, it's pretty much a proxy for gold. So what you'll get is I think a retest of these series of lows in December. Let me draw that in for you. Around about there, 15.53. Um, now that we've broken below the February lows, that's going to kick out a few stops and we'll probably test down towards these lows here um, on the back of that. With respect to the S&P 500, um, what, um, what I was saying previously still holds true. Strong dollar is bad for it. Um, so while, an, while the euro is going lower and continues to test lower, you'll probably see European stocks go higher, but the, DAX will the, the Dow Jones will struggle to rally. So for, for, for me, these numbers have a dual purpose. They're positive for the DAX and European equities, but they're not so good for the Dow and the S&P. Hopefully, we're definitely that seeing that today. And we're certainly the, seeing the that today. pretty muted. We're looking at the uh, the Dow and the S&P both pretty much flat. The S&P is still sitting almost right on 2100, and uh, and the Dow at 18125. It's been trading in an 18,000 even to about 18,300 range, so it's just kind of 
sitting sloppy in the middle of that. And uh, yeah. and so, yeah, the U.S. indices look like they're not really doing much. I mean, they're in, in terms of the upside, it, despite the uh, the rally in uh, in Europe. I, I, I mean, with respect to the DAX, I certainly think there's potential to go quite a bit higher. Um, there's nothing to stop it while the euro drops or continues to fall. So if you see euro dollar at 108, the next target is 105. The lower the euro goes, the more positive that is for European equity markets. So there's no reason to think we can't see 12,000 over the next two or three months. How we get there is another matter. But I, I, I wouldn't want to see a move back below 11,500 on the German DAX in the short to medium term, because if we do, we could get a sharp correction lower. And certainly, I think what's happening with respect to Greece is going to be a factor going forward with respect to European equities. There is a Eurogroup meeting on Monday. I know that they're going to be talking about the latest proposals that Mr. Tsipras has put towards the EU Commission, and they will be talking about them. And any concerns about Greece leaving the Eurozone will, will, will help push European markets or keep a cap on European markets, but what I don't think it will do is will undermine the upward momentum that we've been seeing over the course of the last few weeks and months. So going forward, I would expect a lower euro to continue to underpin European equity markets while at the same time actually hindering U.S. markets. So it was interesting to note that before those jobs numbers came out, the S&P was trading at 2101. It's now at 2095. So, you know, that tells me all I need to know about the direction of travel for U.S. equities. A strong dollar is not something that U.S. equities are going to like. Um, we've seen We've seen a great run on U.S. equity markets. The key support level, as I said just before the numbers came out, is around 2084. We tested that um, a couple of days ago. I see no reason why we can't test that again while we're below 2100, 2105. 20, why, why that number? Because essentially it's the highs of the last couple of days, 2104 um, today and 2105 yesterday. So beware of a short squeeze on the S&P. The market likes to do that as we head into the weekend. But overall, I think what, we, I think what will determine where the S&P goes next is how it reacts around 2084 if it gets there. So, um, you know, you know for, as, as, as far as today is concerned, it's a negative U.S. equity market picture, but it's a fairly positive from a European equity market point of view. A nice bit of divergence there, and I think we're going to continue to see that over the course of the next few sessions. It's also going to be very interesting to see actually how, is the, how the U.S. bond market has actually reacted to those numbers. I'm just going to have a quick look at the U.S. 10-year, which is down here. Um, we've seen a quick We've seen a sharp move lower in prices, which is not surprising. Um, below, below the um, below the trend line support that we saw in September, and we've seen a we've seen a five basis point jump in yields from 211 percent to 216. So certainly that explains why the dollar is so strong today, because of the fact that U.S. Treasury yields have jumped quite sharply in expectation of some form of rate hike by the Fed sometime this year. But as I say, the headline numbers are good. The, under, the internals, probably not so good, but the internals will start to play out next week. Okay, does anyone else have any more questions? I've asked about the DAX. Um, are you okay with um, my comments on the DAX, ladies and gents? With respect to that, weak euro should be fairly positive for the DAX. Um, strong dollar, for, not particularly great for the S&P 500. If that's if that's pretty much it, brilliant. Okay, um, we are recording this, so if you, at any time you want to basically go back and re-listen to any of the comments, um, please feel free to do so. Um, next week, Colin and I will be hosting another event. I think it's next week. Is it next week, Colin? Or is it's it the week, week after? after? I'm, off, I'm off next week. Oh, that's right. You're off next week. That's right. Okay. So in a couple of weeks' time, Wednesday, actually, UK Budget Day, um, we'll be hosting, you and I will be hosting, co-hosting an event, uh, basically covering some of that and talking about 
talking about what to expect from the pound and the UK gilt market and the FTSE 100 um, over the course of the next um, over the next few weeks and months in the lead up to the election. Um, until then, um, unless anyone else has any other questions, I'd like to thank you all for um, listening. Sorry about the delayed nature of the uh, economic data, but unfortunately that was down to factors outside of our control. Hope you enjoyed this um, this monthly webinar, and hopefully you'll um, you'll attend um, next month at uh, around about the same time. Actually, are we actually in next month? Because I know it's Easter, isn't it? Yeah, the U.S. is on the second, I believe, or right. whatever day that is. It's the okay. uh, the first Friday is before Easter. All right. So okay. Well, we'll we'll sort out the dates with respect to that at the time. But otherwise, thanks thanks very much, everyone, and um, look forward to speaking to you at our next event. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day trading.